Psychology 101, Lecture 13. Oh, students, you're in for such a treat today. It's about viruses. How cool is that? Viruses are simply genes packaged in a protein coat. And they're just a mobile genetic element. Uh, viruses cannot carry on metabolism or reproduction, and so they do not qualify as life in the current definition of life. And remember, the current definition of, of life, as we discussed early on, is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution and which resists entropy. Okay, so uh, the definition is failed right on the very first word. It's not self-sustaining. So a virus is um, just bit of protein and a bit of DNA. Um, the protein shell of a virus is called a capsid. The capsid is, is built from um, protein subunits called capsomeres. Capsids can be rod-shaped, polyhedral, complex helical, icosahedral, beautiful shapes. Complex capsoids are found in phages. Viruses have no metabolic enzymes. They have no ribosomes. They're obligate intracellular parasites. That's what they are. And here are some pictures of these um, strange creatures. Um, they do look pretty darn strange, don't they? Here is uh, some more pictures of uh, some more of these very, very strange creatures. Kind of scary looking, no? A virus is so small, it's about 20 nanometers in diameter, it's even smaller than a ribosome. So when you think of that, you know, you're thinking, oh, really small, tiny. And worse, viruses can be crystallized like inorganic min minerals. So you know that you can't crystallize anything that's living. Um, that doesn't work. But these guys can be crystallized. So I don't know if they're really guys. They're just not life. They're right on the boundary of living and non-living systems, and they're considered non-living. The viral genome is either a single linear um, uh, molecule or a circular molecule of nucleic acid with about 3,000 genes, so not a lot of genes. Um, we can have double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded RNA viruses. So a virus can either be a DNA virus or an RNA virus. And look at how tiny a virus is. So that, that, the little orange dots are viruses and they are sitting on top of a cell. Okay, so that is just an amazingly small particle. Viruses are very host specific. They have a lock and key mechanism for fit between the viral surface proteins and the receptor molecules outside cells. They have very narrow ranges. For instance, measles can only occur in humans. But some viruses can have broad ranges, like the West Nile virus, which infects mosquitoes and birds and horses and humans. Viral infection of eukaryotes is limited to certain tissues. The cycle begins when the virus enters the host cell and injects its DNA and reprograms the host cell to copy viral genome and make, make only viral proteins. Viral nucleic acid molecules and capsomeres spontaneously self-assemble into new viruses, so it's sort of like a factory. Hundreds and thousands of viruses exit the host cell, destroying it. And here is a really, really nice um, um, video. I'm not sure if I can actually show it to you, but I'm going to try. A virus is a small infectious particle that hijacks the machinery and metabolism of our cells to grow and reproduce. Each viral particle, or virion, consists of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, in single or double-stranded form, enclosed by a capsid. In most viruses, the nucleocapsid is enclosed by an outer envelope. Influenza type A, an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus, has been widely studied and serves here to illustrate the life cycle of one common virus. Scientists believe that influenza virus is spread from person to person through exposure to large respiratory droplets, direct contact, or airborne dispersal. 
Infection takes place mainly in the respiratory tract. Infection begins with attachment of virus proteins to a receptor on the surface of the host cell. The virus is then taken in the cell by receptor-mediated endocytosis. As the virus enters the cell, the virus is internalized in a membrane-bound capture vesicle that carries the viral core. The vesicle is transported on microtubules inside the cell by host proteins called kinesins. During transport, the membrane of the vesicle fuses with the membrane of the virus and the capsid undergoes uncoating. The viral core RNA and proteins are then released into the cytoplasm where they are guided by host proteins to the nucleus of the host cell. At the nuclear membrane, the viral core uses host protein channels to enter. Inside the nucleus, cell machinery is utilized by the virus to replicate the viral genome and make messenger RNA, mRNA. Some viral mRNA exits the nucleus to exploit cellular ribosomes to direct synthesis of viral proteins. Viral proteins go back to the nucleus to associate with viral RNA. These nucleoproteins again leave the nucleus and use cellular processes to travel to the cell surface. Viral surface proteins are made and processed in the cytoplasm and also travel to the cell surface where they combine with encapsulated nucleoproteins to form progeny viruses which depart from the cell by budding. The virion now goes on to infect other cells. At present, vaccines to stimulate the production of antibodies against the virus and stimulate host cellular responses to ingest the virus remain the best strategy for controlling certain viral diseases. But they are of limited effectiveness against rapidly mutating viruses and are ineffective against viruses that cause the common cold and AIDS. Not cool, huh? But these are these little creatures or uh, non-living creatures that are um, these viruses. Uh, pretty amazing. Viruses can even infect bacteria. As you can see, they were really small and bacteria get sick. Um, we don't care if bacteria get sick, but they do get sick. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, or just phages for short. Phages have the most complex capsids, an elongated capsid head enclosing their DNA, and a protein tailpiece which attaches the phage, the phage to the host and injects the phage DNA. Here we have a T4 virus infecting a bacteria. So that's the little guy with the spindly legs and landing on top of uh, a bacteria. Pretty formidable looking, no? And it's um, on the bacterial surface. And now, just like a spaceship, it's going to land and it's going to make its way in by burrowing in inserting itself in cool yes so that's what viruses do they're very very different from anything that we know um, we have don't know what they really are but uh, we can't study them Double-stranded DNA viruses can replicate by two ways. Uh, there's either a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. The lytic cycle always results in the death of the host cell, and if only the lytic phase is present, and that phage is called a virulent phage. Lysogeny results in coexistence with the host, so there's no lysis of the host cell, but viral DNA is replicated at each cell division and becomes part of the host's DNA. So here is uh, the lytic phase of a uh, lytic cycle of a phage, and you can see the uh, virus landing on number one uh, on top of a bacteria. Uh, in number two, just like in the animation we saw, it is burrowing into the cell wall of the bacteria. And number three, it has now taken over um, and it synthesizes viral genomes and proteins, which um, spontaneously self assemble 
and uh, then uh, the cell membrane of the host bursts and they all re are released and they go on to infect um, other uh, cells. The lysogenic cycle is not so drastic. It replicates the phage genome without destroying the host. The viral DNA molecule is incorporated into the host cell's chromosome. This integrated viral DNA is known as a prophase. Every time the cell, host cell divides, it copies the phage DNA and it passes the copies to daughter cells. Bummer. So here we are with lysogeny, um, and you see the cycle. And um, the this tiny blue strand is the viral DNA, which is added on to the bacterial DNA, and it just keeps on getting copied. Um, there are many classes of animal viruses, depending on their, if they have an envelope or they don't. And uh, here is a list of them, and of what diseases do they cause? So there's, um, let's see, anything good in this list? Uh, retrovirus, yeah, that is the last one. It's a single-stranded RNA, and it is uh, what causes AIDS. Many viruses that infect animals have a membranous envelope. Viral glycoproteins on the envelope bind to specific receptor molecules on the surface of a host cell. There are two mechanisms by which enveloped viruses enter host cells. In one of the mechanisms, the virion attaches to host cell receptors by specific proteins on its surface, called spikes. The envelope of the virus fuses with the plasma membrane of the host, and the nucleocapsid is released directly into the cytoplasm. The nucleic acid then separates from the protein coat. In the second mechanism, the enveloped virus adsorbs to the host cell by specific proteins on its surface, and the virion is taken in by endocytosis. In this process, the host cell plasma membrane surrounds the whole virion and forms a vesicle. The envelope of the virion then fuses with the plasma membrane of the vesicle, and the nucleocapsid is released into the host cytoplasm. The capsid protein is then removed, releasing the nucleic acid of the virus. A naked virion also enters by endocytosis. Since the virus has no envelope, it cannot fuse with the plasma membrane. After being engulfed, the viral nucleic acid is released from the endocytic vesicle. The nucleic acid then separates from the capsid. So that shows you several ways of how uh, viruses will actually enter into a host cell. Um, this is a pictorial representation of the animations. You see the capsid, you see the RNA, you see the en uh, envelope, and uh, you see how it um, is taken in uh, into the host cell. Retroviruses use reverse transcriptase to copy their RNA genome into DNA. The viral DNA that is integrated into the host genome is called a provirus. Unlike a prophage, a provirus remains a permanent resident of the host cell. Major bummer. RNA polymerase transcribes the proviral DNA into RNA molecules. The RNA molecules function both as messenger RNA for synthesis of viral proteins and as genomes for new virus particles released from the cell. Virioids and prions. Diseases caused by vir viral infections affect humans, crops, livestock, smaller, less complex entities, even smaller than vi viruses, are called virioids and prions, really, really small. They also cause disease in plants and animals. So um, these tiny complex en entities that cause disease in plants are called uh, virioids, and in animals are called Prions. Virioids are small circular RNA molecules that infect plants and disrupt their growth. Virioids have a helical uh, capsid or an icosa icosahedral uh, capsid. Prions are slow acting. They're virtually indestructible, unfortunately. Infectious proteins that cause brain diseases in mammals. 
prions propagate by converting normal proteins into the prion version. Scrapie in sheep, mad cow disease, and uh, CJ disease in human are all caused by prions. How prions propagate. So let's look at this. In the first frame, you see a prion. It looks sort of like a heart, maybe, um, shaped protein. And then there's a regular normal protein. Well, the new prion mm -hmm. is just going to add on to the original prion. And it's just going to make more of it. And then you get aggregates of these prions. And that's how um, prions actually will propagate. Prions. Prions cause numerous diseases in mammals, including scrapie in sheep, bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cows, commonly known as mad cow disease, and kurtzfeldt jacob disease in humans. This is a representation of a normal PRP protein in the body. When this protein is misfolded, an abnormally shaped prion is formed instead. A prion propagates by changing other normal proteins into the prion form. When enough of these prion proteins accumulate, they are called aggregates of prions. Eventually, these aggregates cause neurodegenerative symptoms in the host. In all cases, varying degrees of spongiform degeneration can be observed in the central nervous system. Unfortunately, no cure for prion disease has been discovered yet. One of the major difficulties is that prions are virtually indestructible, as opposed to normal proteins. Hopefully, with a little more research, scientists will soon find a solution.